In early March, the governor named his lieutenant, Spencer Cox, to lead the coronavirus task force in Utah. Fast forward five months, and tough choices require tough questions. KSL wanted to know what worked and what didn't. And that's why Mike Hedrick sat down for a one-on-one -on -one with the lieutenant governor to ask Utah's COVID questions. What mistakes have been made over the past three months? This is you know, one of the things that keeps me up at night, and uh, there were lots of mistakes that were made early on in this. Um, obviously, we didn't know much about the virus. We had the philosophy that we were going to try everything. We had the uh, hydroxychloroquine issue. There was an order made, I think an $800,000 order made, which was canceled. No money was ever spent on that. Another failure, a text alert asking anyone crossing into Utah's borders to fill out a questionnaire. It ended up bombarding residents multiple times a day. Uh, that was a failure. We scrapped that after three days. The Healthy Together app, was that a failure? Yeah, so the, the Healthy Together app um, did some really important things. But a key promise that was not delivered, Bluetooth and GPS tracking to aid with contact tracing. We were made some promises that turned out to not be accurate. So and that's so the case. That piece has, has, that piece has been a failure. It didn't work the way we had hoped it would. So if that's a case, the state spending six million dollars on this thing and it hasn't been effective in your mind and yeah, in the minds of a lot so of people. So we're not spending six million dollars on that. That was that was if everything worked out over the length of the contract. So what's so the cost that, of it that now? Full, um, we can get that to you uh, and I'm happy to provide that. I don't have that with me right now. But Turns we'll, out that's we'll a bit complicated. Yeah, the state's together. already paid over 3.7 million dollars for the app for functions that do work, such as symptom tracking and connecting with testing sites. The rest of the contract is being renegotiated, but not necessarily canceled. And yeah, I'm, I'm one that if it doesn't work, you should get your money back. And, and so those, those conversations are, are definitely happening. And you've since been offered free technology to help in this that sounds like it would be more effective in helping with contact tracing. Are, are you going to take advantage of that? Well, we will continue to evaluate all of those technologies. And yes, if there's a free one that actually works, hallelujah, I'd be the first to sign up for that. Was the COVID task force effective? Yeah, the COVID task force was very effective. The role of the COVID task force was really twofold. The first was to figure out what our response to this virus was going to be and to set up the structure for that. Um, in that sense, the task force worked themselves out of a job. And, and what we did was we set up what ultimately became the unified command. Every member or organization involved in the coronavirus task force is involved in the unified command in some way. There is not a decision that has been made. So what are those things the lieutenant governor counts as wins? Up. Now creating bed space, testing capacity, and contact tracing. The no bid process early on, how'd that work out? Yeah, so it, it, it actually worked out very, very well. People love to focus on the one or two things that didn't work when we should focus on the thousands of things that did work. The testing supplies, the masks, the gowns, the gloves, all of those other things were also done in an emergency procurement under a no bid contract. And the whole idea behind that CARES Act funding was let's give it to the states, let them experiment, let's go out and see what works, which means that people are going to make mistakes. The state loosens up restrictions, cases go up. Did we open things up too soon? No, I, I don't think so. Um, we, we knew that that would happen. What we didn't do as a people collectively were to remain vigilant and cautious. Outside is always better than inside. Short time together is always better than, than a long time together. A mask is always better than no mask. Um, if we will do those things, we absolutely can be this. But government can't, can't make you do those things. Sometimes you hear in this whole thing, hey, we're learning as we go along. Yeah, we've made mistakes here and there. Does that seem to be an easy out? for whenever mistakes are made to say that? No, I, I don't think it's an easy out. It just happens to be the truth. We do have to take responsibility for the mistakes that we make, and that's why we have these types of conversations. Um, we've been very clear about that, that this has not been a perfect response, um, that we're, we're figuring this out as we go. We're taking the best advice that we can get. When we get better information, when we get new information, we have to be willing to pivot and to make those changes. We, we shouldn't be pointing back to, you know, they told us not to wear masks, so why should we be wearing masks? Well, the reason they told us not to was they didn't have good data and now they have better data and the data is very clear that masking helps we we need as a society we all need to be humble enough to uh, to admit when we're wrong and to change and politics is the one place where we don't do that anymore the lieutenant governor also spoke about his views on a statewide mask mandate and the role politics in a presidential election have played on the response to COVID-19. You can find those answers along with tonight's interview with Mike on ksltv.com.